Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing, guys? Uh, this is going to be my second video. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this segment is going to be about drawing the elastic curve or the deflection of uh, beams as far as the method of calculating the deflections. Uh, we're going to get into that in some other recordings, hopefully, inshallah. Hopefully, not too many. Inshallah, we will meet face to face soon, I hope. Now, as far as the deflection goes, we have two types of deflection. One is the uh, elastic deformation, and that means that I have uh, purely elastic materials, which means that whatever deformation I impose due to the load, once the load is removed, then the deflection is removed, and the beam is supposed to go back to its original position. On the other hand, the plastic or inelastic deformation means it's permanent, so if I'm applying a load and I'm in that plastic range, say, then even after I remove the load, the deformation is still there. We will only discuss the elastic deformation. And again, elastic means if this is my stress and this is my strain, then this relationship is linear and the slope is Young's modulus E. Pretty much we're saying that my stress is equal to epsilon E. So if I apply any load on that curve, and if I remove it, I will get back to zero. That's what elastic, elasticity means. Now, since I will not be drawing the deflection of the beam in 3D, obviously, so I always will represent the beam by a line. You've seen that when we draw the shear and, and bending moment diagram. So just to read what I've put down here, the deflection diagram represents the elastic curve for the points at the centroids of the cross-sectional areas. So for this beam right here, which has a width B and a height H, and this is my center line right here. So this deflection that you are seeing, this, which is due to the load P, some arbitrary load or some arbitrary distributed load. So this deflection is representative of this centroid that you're seeing right here and this being again my beam centroid now some typical deflection of joints so if i have a roller so we know that the deflection the vertical deflection is equal to zero but there is an allowed rotation and that's why at this point here the moment is equal to zero while the reaction is not Okay, so I have a reaction here, but just because the deflection is equal to zero. If I have a pin or a hinge, again, delta is equal to zero, then by delta I mean this support movement, and that is equal to zero. Still, I have an angle of rotation theta, again, meaning that it's allowed to rotate, so my moment there is equal to zero. If I go to the fixed end, I have both equal to zero. There is no theta and there is no deflection. As you can see, that slope is almost equal to zero. And as I go away from the fixed end, I will start developing some angle theta. As far as frames are concerned, I have what I call a fixed connected joint. And in that, I will maintain a 90 degree. So if it's 90 degrees before deformation, I will have a 90 degree after deformation, which means that this angle here and this angle here are equal and usually the angles are representative of the slope of the deflected shape or the elastic shape and i just want to go back here so if this is my deflected shape and this is now the slope to that deflected shape so this is my angle theta and this is the rotation is called clockwise rotation okay so going back to this one here i have the same for this frame this part here right so again this is my deflected shape and this is my slope right here so this is now theta right and the same thing is here now this is my deflected shape now this is my slope over here and then i go from the undeflected shape to the slope just like i did over here or what we call the undeflected cord. So the rotation here is clockwise again, while the rotation here is also clockwise. Again, I'm going from the undeflected shape to 
the slope. If I go to a pin connected joint, which means this joint is not rigid, I could actually put a pin over here, then I will have two different rotations, all right, because I'm no longer maintaining that 90 degree angle between the two frame members. So that's why I have theta one and theta two, and both of them are not equal, okay? Now, I'm going to start off by drawing the deflected shape. And I'm going to start off with these two examples. This is example number one, and this is example number two. And I'm going to start off with example number one, obviously. So what I have is uh, 20 kilonewton per meter on the, from A to B, and then I have a concentrated load of 30 kilonewton at point C. What I usually like to do in class, and obviously I won't be able to do that, I would ask you to come out and start drawing the possible shapes that you think is going to happen. Now, there are two things that we need to know. First of all, because here we have two supports at A and B, so the deflection at these two points are equal to zero. So one might suggest the following, in which I'm going to assume that between A and B, because of the load, it's going to deflect in this way, and I call this concave up, which means that the deflected shape is concave up. So that's an assumption of mine. And then when I go to the cantilever, again, this here must be equal to zero, and this here also must be equal to zero, right, at the support. So then I'm going to C, and I'm saying, okay, well, since it's a cantilever, it's going to deflect at this that way. So I'm assuming that this, or I'm saying that this might be a possible deflection curve. And you would be right, okay, to assume that. Other people might say, no, actually I'm gonna assume this. I'm going to assume that still I'm gonna have a concave up deflection between A and B, but I'm thinking that the 20 kilonewton per meter is gonna impose more of a load, and that means that instead of BC going downward like we did before, it will actually go up and that, that 30 kilonewton there is not enough to maintain the deflection to be downward. And to that, I would say you are correct as well, okay? So now we have two possibilities with two possible correct answers. And then there's another one, okay? And in that one, I'm going to assume that, well, Maybe be instead of this being concave up, I would say, well, that 30 kilonewton is going to overpower the 20 kilonewton per meter, and it's going to push the beam down, and then that would also lead to making this to be concave downward. And I would also say to you that you might be correct as well. Then the question is, well, which one is right? How would I know what's the possible correct answer for this? And uh, to do that, I would probably, or I would use the bending moment diagram as an assistance. So first of all, let's draw the bending moment diagram for this, okay? Now, again, I really don't need the reaction for this one. So if I multiply this 30 times two, I would get 60, and then the, the rotation of the moment is gonna be as such. So it's going, again, I've drawn the tension side. So to me, negative, positive, and I draw always, always, always on the tail, so this is going to be my minus 60 kilonewton, okay? And since, again, moment at these points here is equal to zero, and at this point are equal to zero, so this is going to be a straight line. And here I'm gonna use the trick that I've shown you before. I'm gonna extend a straight line from here to here, all right? So this is minus 60, this is zero, then I'm gonna go right in the middle, right at this point over here, which is right here. And this value is going to be minus 60 plus zero divided by two, and that's going to be minus 30, right? And then I'm gonna add to it plus WL squared, which is this, 20 times four squared over eight, which is gonna be equal to 10. So the overall value here is going to be minus 20. So what you notice now that again, this is negative, so this is negative. So the whole beam is under negative moment. So what do I know of the bending shape if I have a negative moment? 
Well, I know that the bending of the beam is going to be concave downward, right? Again, negative moment means like this. If it was a positive moment, then it's going to be like that. So since both of them are negative, so both of them are going to be concave upward like that, right? I mean, concave downward. So in that case, again, I have to maintain that the deflection at A is equal to zero and at B is equal to zero, which means my deflected shape is going to look something like that. So as you've noticed, out of the three deflected shape that I did, the third one or the last one was kind of the correct one. Okay, now this distance here, this, uh, well, we actually need to calculate the deflections. Again, this is an exaggerated scale, but this is how we usually find out about the deflected shapes by usually drawing the bending moment diagram. Okay, so this is one example. The other example is this. And here I have, again, the span is 60 meters. It's an A, B, C, and D. I have uh, 200 kilonewton per me uh, 200 kilo. Oh, this is wrong. This should be 200 kilonewton. Okay, so it's not 200 kilonewton per meter. It's just concentrated load of 200 kilonewton. And here I have 20 kilonewton per meter as my distributed load. Again, we don't need the reaction here to draw the bending moment diagram for this. Again, it's going to be since this is a distributed load, it's going to be 20 times two times half one. So this is going to be a minus 40 kilonewton meters. And from a, because it's a symmetry, I'm going to have the same thing as well over here too. Now, since this is distributed load, so this is going to be second degree, right? And again, this is going to start at zero and go all the way up to 40. And the same thing is on that direction as well, on the other part of the beam. Now, again, using that trick, I'm going to superimpose when I, here, I'm going to superimpose two things. I'm going to superimpose the WL square over 8. Okay. And, this, and I'm going to impose the PL over 4, because this is smack down in the middle. So, again, since this is 40 and this is 40, so this value is obviously 40. So, I'm going to have minus 40 plus 20 times 2 square over 8 plus 200 times 2 over 4, which is 110. So this value is going to be 70 kilonewton meter. All right. Again, so here you have to notice a couple of things. Here's my negative moment and here's my positive moment. So this is going to be concave up, concave down. This is going to be concave up. And this is going to be, well, let me just redo that again. So this is concave down and this is concave up, and this is concave down. Now, what you've noticed here, I have a zero moment here, and I have zero moment here. So zero moments mean that here I'm gonna have a change in an inflect, oh, it's what we call an inflection point, where it is going to change from concave up to concave down. So if I do attempt to draw this, now this is supposed to be my deflected shape right here again here you can see that at this point here it's going to change from concave up to concave down again it's not it's not the scale but uh, you get the gist of it well and you're asking me so why do we need to draw this well when we get into the moment area method, we actually need to know how to draw the elastic curve. And also, I'm going to tell you, we don't have to be very accurate in drawing it. Uh, it actually it allows me to fix my mistakes in drawing, and I will show you that when we get to uh, doing this uh, down the road. Uh, so this kind of covered the elastic curve for beams, and now we are going to do that for frame. Now, drawing the deflected shapes for frames is going to be a little bit different, in my opinion, or easy. So if you look at this frame right here, this is, uh, here we have a hinge and here we have a fixed end and I'm applying a load. So the first thing that would happen, the column is actually going to deflect in this direction that I'm showing you right, right there and the other one as well 
So, but the only difference here is here there is a slope, so there is a rotation right there. Here the slope is almost zero, and then it starts to going uh, straight right, right here. So, so because of the rotation of both columns is going to be clockwise, that means also I am going to have a clockwise rotation over here and since I'm going to maintain a 90 degrees between these two members this one and this one after deflection and the same one goes for this member here and this member here and have the same clockwise rotation so here to maintain that you've noticed that I cannot have I need kind of a change of deflection or curvature and it doesn't have to be necessarily in the middle but again so so to maintain the 90 degree over here and to maintain the 90 degree this needs to change from concave up to concave down so i can have the clockwise rotation that was initiated by the uh, columns here okay uh, another example now if i have with uh, two bay and i'll call this bay one for instance and this is bay two then i'm using the same reasoning and you can see again here the change in curvature from concave up to concave down the same thing over here just to maintain the 90 degree because it is a rigid connection over here now if we go now for this frame here, things are going to be a little bit different. Since I'm a, a, applying a distributed load, let's say on the middle. So here what happens, I'm going to start actually with this guy right here. So from this load, this is going to push this beam here, concave upward. And which will cause both a clockwise rotation at this joint here and at this joint here right there as well so that will lead to these two columns being pushed out as well remember this is rigid connection so this is a rigid connection so this is going to rotate clockwise and this is also going to rotate clockwise okay and that will lead to pushing these two out And because of this, these two will lead to both of these beams right here. I'm going to figuratively calling them beams or girders in the case of frames to kind of be pushed outward. And that will now become from, as you can see, this was concave upward. Now this is going to be concave downward. And from the same reasoning, these two now to maintain that 90 degrees over here and the 90 degrees over here is going to be pushed like that so this is kind of if we're talking about angle and rotations if you want to ignore all that think of it from another perspective so i'm pushing this down okay so since i'm pushing this down this is going to go down as well as these are going down they probably are going to push these two out right because it's going to be a weight on them so if this is pushing down so these two are getting pushed out now if i go to this right here based on what i have since this is pushed out so for this to be pushed out from this so this has to be kind of go upward in the other direction so it's like i'm raising this okay so if, if i'm raising this so i expect those two to push inward okay and the same thing goes over here so if you're not comfortable with the maintaining of 90 degrees thinking of it that way okay so to say that again i am pushing inward right this push to the beam will lead to these two being pushed out okay as this is pushed out for this section here right here this means that now since this is pushed in and this is pushed in, this only can happen if i raise this up okay all right so this is pretty much what i wanted to say for uh, drawing the deflected shape for both frames and uh, beams and this will end this uh, segment for today 
uh, my next video is going to be on uh, the moment area theorem and you guys have a nice day evening whenever you are seeing this and uh, god bless